We also have an opportunity for fourth to eighth graders if they want. Um, the message today, you know, God's Word kind of addresses everything. And so today's message could be maybe rated PG-13, if you will. We're going to get into some immorality and things like that. So if you'd rather your fourth to eighth grader have to do something else, we're going to have something available for that. Um, but they're more than welcome to stay as well. So we'll leave that up to your parents uh, in terms of that. But let's say this blessing, uh, and then we'll dismiss the kids. Children. God is a God who protects and restores. May you find safety in His love for you. Hi, kids. Have a great morning. All right, for the past several weeks, uh, we have been uh, talking about how we live in a culture that encourages us to take it to the limit in every area of our lives. So we fill up our schedules, we fill up our minds, we fill our lives with relationships, we fill up our homes with stuff, which in the process empties our checking accounts. Um, our culture encourages us. If we go with what our culture encourages, we end up with lives with absolutely no margin whatsoever. Margin is the space between uh, where we could be and where we ought to be. Margin is having money left over at the end of the month. It's having time left over at the end of the day. Time for what matters most in life. Margin, if you have it, it means that you can have stress come into your life without being stressed out because you have the margin emotionally to be able to handle that. Well, today I want us to talk about what might be the most important topic within this series. I want us to talk about developing and maintaining moral margin. And uh, when I talk about moral margin specifically, I want us to talk about morality as it relates to our sexuality. Um, so what we're going to do is I want us to talk a little bit about, about what our culture encourages us to do morally. To do, uh, and at the same time, what God would encourage us to do. So let's talk about culture's pressure in the area of sexuality and morality. And then let's talk about what God's loving counsel is to us. Now, to begin this conversation, we kind of need to begin where we've started almost each message this week. And that is to, in some ways, state the obvious. And that is that everybody has moral limits. Everybody. Uh, especially as it relates to sexuality and to sex. Everybody has limits. Sometimes these limits are self-imposed limits. Maybe because of the way you grew up or because of what you believe. But you have decided, hey, we're going to draw the line. And we're not going to go as far as some other people might go. And we're not going to do everything that society might encourage us to do morally. There's things we're not going to look at. There's things we're not going to fill our minds with. Uh, some of us have self-imposed limits. Some of us have spiritually imposed limits. It, maybe you believe the Bible is true and that that is God's word to us. And so you have sort of adopted that what you take the Bible seriously. What God says uh, should be the line morally and sexually that that that's where the line is going to be. There are legal limits. Uh, there are some things that legally you can't do morally. There are certain types of relationships that you you can't be involved in. There are certain places that you can't go that shouldn't even exist legally. So legally there are moral limits. But even for the person who doesn't keep the law, even for the person who has no spiritual basis whatsoever and doesn't even have an inner moral compass that says right from wrong, they, even they have practical limits. Everybody has limits when it comes to morality. So the question we have to ask ourselves, and the question we've been sort of coming to in every message this series, is will we adopt the limits and the standards that our culture pushes on us, or... Will we step back from that line and will we create some moral margin and allow ourselves to be limited by the limits that God leads us to? In every category that we've talked about so far, we've said that if we follow God, he is going to lead us to a life of margin. And that is especially true when we talk about this area of morality. Here's the thing we understand as we start is that everybody has limits. You know, even the most liberal person, the person who's living like all the way out on the edge, if you push them hard enough, they will eventually come to a point where they draw a line and say, no, no, that, that should not be allowed. That kind of relationship shouldn't exist. No, he should not treat her that way. 
Everybody at some point has a limit. So the question is, is are there limits morally? No, the question is, where are they? Where, where should they be? What's the best and wisest way to live morally as it relates to our sexuality? Now, this topic is really confusing. It probably shows why this message is really so needed, because every day our culture sends us two messages at the same time. Kind of constantly we're berated with these two messages. The first is that our culture says, go as far as you can go. In other words, take it to the limit. Morally, go as far as you can. Get involved in as many things as you can. Don't miss out on any experiences. Look at everything you can look at. Fill your minds. Go as far as you can possibly go. And then at the same time, our culture says that if you cross certain lines, you're going to get your hands slapped. Go as far as you can go, but if you cross certain lines, you might get sued. <laughs> go as far as you can possibly go, but if you cross certain lines, you might lose your job. Go as far as you can go, but if you cross certain lines, society is going to turn on you and it's going to demonize you. And all of a sudden it's going to say, how disgusting, I can't believe you do something like that. So on the one hand, our culture sort of baits us and sort of encourages us to push it as far as we can possibly go. And then as soon as we cross that line, the same culture chastises us and punishes us. So for example, in our culture, we're constantly aware of the issue of teen pregnancy. Uh, you know, we don't want teenagers getting pregnant. But what do we do? As a culture, we market everything to teenagers with a sexual hook, don't we? It's like we bait them sexually, and then as soon as a girl shows up pregnant, we say, well, what's, what's wrong with you? And she says, society pushed me in this direction. Or you'll hear about a guy who's in an abusive dating relationship, or he's forcing a girl to go farther than she wants to. And yet, at the same time, he grew up in a culture that was constantly baiting him in that direction. Constantly <coughs> building these expectations of what a woman's supposed to do and how she's supposed to respond. Is he responsible for his actions? Yeah. Is she responsible for her actions? Yes. But they're both in a society where they've been baited to live on the edge of moral disaster. And then when they go over the line, then society looks at them and says, what's wrong with you? You know, in our society, we still have a negative attitude towards men who run around and cheat on their spouses. And yet at the same time, these men live in a culture where they're constantly baited to live right on the edge of making bad moral decisions. So on the one hand, society says, take it to the limit. Go as far as you can go. Don't refuse yourself any pleasure. Look at everything you want. Fill your mind. But then as soon as you cross that line, you've done something illegal. As soon as you cross that line, you've done something irresponsible. As soon as you cross that line, you know, now there's consequences. We were constantly tugged and pulled with these two messages every day. You know, the message is, go as far as you can go, but don't get her pregnant. <clears throat> go as far as you can go, but don't break the law. Go as far as you can go, but don't mistreat her. Go as far as you can go, but don't get addicted. That's our culture. That's this tension that you and I live in every day. That's the trend. Now, to make matters worse, we are all, all of us, wired to live in a such a way that we want to know where that line is, and we want to live right on the line. That's how we're wired in every other area of our life. I'll prove it to you. If you're driving down the highway and the speed limit says 65, you don't shoot for 55, do you? No, you, 65, you go right to 65, and if you go a few miles over, you look around, and you stay there, right? It doesn't matter if it's 55, 65, 75 miles an hour. You go to the line, and you live there. Um, you know, if your curfew is 12 o'clock midnight, you don't shoot for 11 o'clock. No, you shoot for 12 on the dot, maybe a few minutes over. Uh, my brother-in-law, this, this is for free, okay? Uh, when he was growing up, his parents, when they set a curfew, they didn't want to stay up. So if you have teenagers, this could be really helpful. They didn't want to stay up, so they'd say, you have to be home at midnight. But then they would go to bed, and they'd set the alarm right by their bed for midnight. He had to get in the house, sneak into their room, and turn off the alarm. And if he didn't get it off before it went off, there would be consequences. Isn't that brilliant? <laughs> when our curfew's midnight, we don't shoot for 11. We shoot right to the minute. 
If you tell your spouse, hey, I'm going to be home at 6, you don't shoot to get home at 5. You shoot to get home at 6, and it's probably closer to 6.15. You know, if you're counting calories, you use them all up, right? You don't plan on having tons left over. Now, here's the problem. When it comes to the speed limit, if you go a few miles over, 5, 10 miles per hour over, there's no big consequence. If your curfew, if you, if you end up 5 or 10 minutes past your curfew, there's not really, a, there's no big deal about that. If, uh, if you're a few calories over your diet, no big deal. If you're a few dollars over a line item in your budget, there's no huge consequence. But if you cross certain lines morally, you pay for those for the rest of your life in some cases. If you cross certain lines morally, kids might grow up without a dad in the home. If you cross certain lines morally, you can lose your self-esteem. If you cross certain lines morally, you could lose your job, lose your reputation. So society says, come on, come on, live right here on the edge. Get as much as you can. And so we live on the edge, and the problem is there's no margin. There is no margin for error. The slightest mistake, one bad night, one night with temptation where you go a little too far, and that makes all the difference in the world. And so what our Heavenly Father says, because He loves us, He says, you know what, you already know this from common sense, but you have to have moral margin. I don't want you living on the line because when you live on the line, there's no room for error. If you make one mistake and you're living on the line, you could pay for it. You could pay for it relationally. There could be a scar or some sort of memory that, that lives with you for the rest of your life. The things that matter most in life could be held in the balance. And so for those of us who are followers of God, for those of us who are Christ followers, we would expect that for someone who loves us, that they would warn us, they would counsel us to, to live with moral margin. And when we open up scriptures, that's exactly what we find. Um, there are many passages that we could go to this morning. I'm going to take us to one where the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says exactly what we would expect a loving God would say to us about our morality and about our sexuality. Uh, if you would, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're not going to get into all of the contextual details of this passage, uh, but suffice it to say that morality was a big deal in the church of Corinth, and specifically sexuality. Um, actually, Corinth was not that dissimilar from our own world today. Um, so let's listen to God's counsel regarding our sexuality. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Paul says, flee from sexual immorality. Uh, the Greek word for flee is the word fugo. It's a pretty cool word to say. Why don't we say it together? Ready? Fugo. Yeah. Now say it with gusto because you can't say this word without it. That's the, the point of this word. Say fugo. Ready? Fugo. fugo. Yes. Uh, this word here, fugo, it means flee. It doesn't mean flirt with. It doesn't mean get as close to the line as you possibly can without going over it. No, it, it means flee. It means tuck tail and run. As soon as you see temptation coming, as soon as something is coming that might have the chance of dragging you over the edge, as soon as anything that even hints of sexual morality is coming at you, God's encouragement to us is to get out of there as fast as you can. If you look into this word fugo, it means to seek safety by flight. It means to run away. It means to escape from something dangerous or deadly. In other words, God's telling us that when we encounter something tempting sexually, we're not supposed to just hang around the line and hope that we don't cross it. No, our loving Father says, run away as fast as you can. Turn in the opposite direction. Put as much space between you and that thing as, as humanly possible. And God tells us that because he loves us. Now, the rest of verse 18 is actually going to answer the why question. Why are we to flee from sexual sin? So let's keep reading. Flee from sexual morality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. 
Now, there are parts of this verse that are quite intuitive to us, and there's other parts I wish Paul would have gone into a lot greater detail um, here. First, he says, all other sins. And just think about those three little words. What do those mean? That means that, that what he's about to say is that sexual sins are in a category all of their own. That there's something unique about sexual sin that sets it apart from all other types of sin. It's not that it's unforgivable. Forgiveness isn't the issue here. No, the, the blood of Jesus covers sexual sin just like any other sin. Now, forgiveness is not the issue. What he's saying is there's a level of consequence that accompanies sexual sin that's different than anything else. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. Whoever sins sexually sins against his own body. What he's saying is there's a personal consequence to sexual sin that runs so deep you're not only sinning against the person you're sinning with, you're, you're sinning against yourself in, in a unique way. And this is where I wish Paul would have given us a lot more, because uh, as soon as you read that, I don't know, questions start coming to mind, right? Like, I can think of a lot of other sins that are against our own bodies. But as I've been reading about this, what most commentators would agree on is that Paul is saying there's, there's something unique in the consequences of sexual sin. There's a personal significance that makes it different. The man or woman who sins sexually, they carry with them a scar. They carry with them a memory. They carry with them an attitude, a view on life that if they're not careful, has the potential of distorting all of life for the rest of your life. And that's what Paul was dealing with in Corinth. He's saying, you think sex is just about physical bodies. It's not. You think sex is just some physical act and it doesn't affect your relationships, it doesn't affect your relationship with God, and that's, that's just not true. He says all other sins a person commits are outside the body. Whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Now, not only is sexual sin unique in that it has unique consequences, but it's also unique in the way that God asks us to respond to it. I mean, think of how God asks us to respond to other things in Scripture. I found it really fascinating, and we won't turn there, I'll put it up here for you. In Ephesians 6, Paul, he's talking about spiritual warfare. This is the whole body, uh, the armor of Christ, and how we're supposed to respond to the schemes of the devil. Look how Paul encourages us to respond when the devil is attacking us. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Okay, so in this case... If you're being attacked by Satan himself, God's encouragement to us is to stand, is to hold our ground. But when it comes to sexual sin, there's no standing. There's no fighting it. There's no, hey, let's debate this and try to conquer it. No, the only way you win is to turn around and run away as fast as you can. That's not cowardly. That's the only way you win when fighting this kind of sin. We're to flee. It's almost like Paul is telling us, um, cultivate a horror for this kind of sin. It's in a category all by itself. We're to be so terrified by what could happen if we were to fall over the edge morally that we're to take every precaution to back away from the edge and put as much space between us and the temptation. You know how uh, parents are in the parking lot with their kids? how they're perpetually terrified because they know at any instant it could turn terrible. So every parent, if you watch them in the parking lot, they're always extremely petrified. I almost think that's the attitude Paul is encouraging us here, is when it comes to this, to cultivate this same sort of terror that makes us hyper-careful and hyper-vigilant. We're to flee. This category requires a unique response because it's uniquely damaging. And so our Father says, back away. Don't, don't flirt with, but flee from sexual immorality. Because he loves us that much. He doesn't want us to have to deal with the damaging consequences. There's one other thing I want us to note in 1 Corinthians 6, before we start talking a little bit more applicationally. And that is that not only does Paul tell us what to flee from, but he tells us what we're fleeing towards. Verse 19 and 20, he says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. 
You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. Now we're not going to get into all of this right now. There is so much good stuff here. We'll get to it in other messages. But I simply want us to see that as God calls us away from the line morally, he, he gives us an entirely new purpose with our bodies. The picture isn't that we're running away from sexual morality, but that we're looking at it and kind of almost wishing it longingly at what we're missing out on. No, the picture here is that we have a completely different path open to us. Our bodies are now these dwelling places of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And His work in our life shows up in the fruit of the Spirit that's on display for all to see. He's making the point that there are these two paths. There's the path that our culture pushes us towards, which is to live on the edge of moral disaster. And there's this other path where, where we are these temples of the Holy Spirit producing fruit through our bodies and honoring God in the process. God loves us too much. So if we had to take this passage in 1 Corinthians 6 and try to boil it down, uh, it would be something like, don't flirt with, but flee from sexual morality. He invites us to put new limits in place, to put space between us and the edge. And so what I want us to do is spend the remaining time just talking very uh, practically, very applicationally, very specifically, in fact, probably uncomfortably specifically um, about this topic. So here would be the first thing I would say, is sort of the importance of pre-deciding. The importance of deciding on the front end where the boundaries are. And this is crucial both in dating, but also in marriage. So let's talk about dating first. And this applies to teenagers as well as to single people. The importance of pre-deciding how far you're going to go sexually. You already have limits. There, there's a line somewhere. Uh, the question is, are you going to sort of adopt the limit that culture is sort of pushing, or are you going to accept the limit that your Heavenly Father is leading you towards? So you need to pre-decide how far you're going to go. And, uh, and the limit you set, the standard that you're going to live by needs to be so far back from the line that if, if you happen to, to break your own standard, there, there's room for you to be able to handle that. You see, if you set your limit far enough back and then on one sort of hot, steamy Friday night, you, you end up breaking your own standard, well, okay, maybe there's a little bit of guilt. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe the relationship's a little bit damaged. That, some, something that'll go away in a couple weeks. But if you're living right on the edge and, and you have one mistake morally, it could be something you carry around with you for the rest of your life. No, the wise thing to do is to set your standard so high that if you violate your standard, there's enough margin that you can deal with that, that you can handle it. So you have to pre-decide where that line is. Because if your only line is, hey, I don't want to have sex before I'm married, you're setting yourself up for moral disaster because there's a lot of room between, hi, and my name is Johnny, and sex, right? There's a lot of steps in there. And so you have to pre-decide where your personal limit is. So the question that always comes up is, well, how far? Where should that limit be? And, um, you know, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give you the answer, right? This is, this, is, this is worth the price of admission, which was nothing. So um, you should go as far, uh, as far as you want the person you marry to have gone with the person they dated last before they dated you. Does that make sense? Uh, you should set your standard where you want the person you're going to marry to have set their standard with the person they date right before they dated you. And you're like, well, I don't want them to have done anything. <laughs> well, exactly. Well, maybe a little, but not very far, and that's, that's the point. See, we've talked a lot about the negative potential of sex, but there is an equal and opposite positive and powerful side to sex within marriage. God is not anti-sex. No, God created sex. God, God loves it. But it's like a river. It's beautiful. It's powerful in the right context. But when it overflows its banks, it is destructive. And it is deadly. And so for single people, pre-deciding where your limit is, where your standards are, and setting that far enough back from the edge is the wisest and best way 
to enjoy all that God intended sex to be within marriage someday. Now let me just address married people for a second. What does pre-deciding look like in marriage? Uh, it'd be really valuable to, have, uh, to sit down and have a conversation and decide, hey, where are the boundaries, especially when it comes to members of the opposite sex? Where, where are those for us in our marriage? Um, and we can't take our cues from culture. Again, we can see where culture's headed, and, and it's not pretty. So we don't want to take our cues from there. Um, you know, we need to create our own boundaries that are going to safeguard and protect what we value most. And the benefit of having a conversation like that is that you can tailor it to your own experience, to your own marriage. So uh, let me give you a couple examples of pre-decisions that we sort of operate in ours, and, and you'll have to tailor them to your own. Uh, one is that, that I don't counsel women. Now, that might make me a bad pastor, but I never claim to be a good pastor. Um, but I don't counsel women. If, if someone comes in, if a woman comes in and wants to meet, I might meet with them once. And it'll be with the door open. It might be with a third party in there. But shortly after that, I'm going to connect them to one of the women on staff. I'm going to connect them to my wife. I'm going to connect them to one of many godly women here in the church who can help them walk through what they're going through. We can help every person at this church. I'm just not going to be the one to do it. It's one of the sort of pre-decisions that we've made. Another one. We don't drive alone in the car with a member of the opposite sex. And there are lots of times this is really impractical and terribly fuel inefficient. Um, but this is just one of those boundaries that we've put in place to safeguard and protect our marriage. And, you know, there have been a few times when it's been unavoidable, and those are situations where we just communicate with each other and make sure we all know what's happening. Um, here's another one. We include a third party in text or email communications. If I need to communicate with a member of the opposite sex, in almost every case, there's a really obvious third party I can put on there. If I'm texting someone, I can include their husband. If I'm texting someone, I can include my wife. If I'm texting someone, I can CC someone else on staff. There, there's, it's almost always very easy to add a third party. I haven't done this perfectly, but that's our habit. That is our, our goal. One of these pre-decision kind of things. And I'll give one more, but the point, again, isn't that these are the right ones. The point is that as a couple, it's important to pre-decide these kind of things to safeguard uh, your marriage from sexual morality. Uh, the, sec the last one I'll say is that uh, we don't go out to eat alone with members of the opposite sex. Now, you might be saying, sheesh, this seems a little bit ridiculous. But most affairs, if you look at the stats, start in some sort of casual situation like that. And so to safeguard, we're going to set the line before that so that that never happens. But bigger than any of these specific pre-decisions, again, is the importance of deciding ahead of time as a couple, hey, where are our boundaries going to be? And are we going to set them far enough back from the edge that, that it's wise and it's beneficial? So pre-deciding. Uh, one other applicational thought uh, I'll just say is that the eyes lead the way. I mean, this is where Christians seem so out of step with our culture, because our culture will say there's absolutely nothing wrong with looking. Don't touch. Don't get involved with necessarily, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with looking. Looking is harmless. But Jesus says the opposite. I'll show you just a couple passages where Jesus says this. Jesus says the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body is full of light, but if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body is full of darkness. Jesus says the eyes lead the way. Chapter 4, Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus is saying, the eyes, they put you on a path. They put you on a path towards the edge every time. There's nothing neutral about just looking. It puts us on that path. And, and God's encouragement to us is to flee from the edge. So for all of us, and this isn't just a male issue, actually. If you look at the stats, this is a male and a female issue. Uh, fleeing sexual morality, it begins with our eyes. 
I can't remember if I've told this story or not, but uh, when I was doing high school ministry back in Ohio, every summer I would take a group of students and we'd go to Cedar Point, uh, which I think Six Flags, but much, much bigger. And so I'm there with a bunch of high school boys, and if you've been to an amusement park, you know that is not a lust-free environment. There is lots of skin showing, right? And so we'd kind of make a game of it. We'd be walking around the amusement park, and if anybody saw some temptation headed this way, they would yell out, SW, seductive woman. And then all of us <laughs> would look the other way. It was quite effective. It kind of made us seem pretty weird because we were saying SW left and right all day long. Um, but trying to guard our eyes. Uh, a couple months ago, uh, Jen and I went to Bass Hall. We went and saw the musical Miss Saigon. And uh, we love musicals. We'd never seen this one. Uh, we're pretty excited about it. But I have to tell you, I probably spent 30 to 40% of the time looking at the floor. In fact, I bet the woman next to me thought I was sleeping. Um, but there was just lots of scantily clad women on stage. And, um, yeah. You know, listen, I'm not trying to say I'm perfect with my eyes. In fact, my wife can tell you that's not the case. But the front lines of how we flee from sexual morality, the front lines for most of us is going to be what we allow into our eyes, into our field of vision. So let me just throw out a couple questions for you to think through. What kind of entertainment do you consume? Is it deadening the horror of this kind of sin? Because that's what, that's what our culture does. Through the entertainment, it just sort of progresses us towards the edge and says, this is normal, this is okay. So what kind of entertainment do we consume? What kind of jokes do we laugh at? What thoughts do we allow to pass through our minds and to dwell there without repenting of them and acknowledging that they are indeed sin? <coughs> we have to be proactive and not passive against the threats that come in our eyes. And specifically, uh, thinking about pornography. Um, well, I'll never forget, my brother-in-law one time was saying, Hey, Johnny, what if I set a Playboy magazine on the corner of your desk? And I and said, You're not, you know, don't, don't look at that. Like, how long could you go without looking at that? And he's like, the reality might be that 95% of the time you might be strong, you might be, you know, resilient and, and not look at it. But there's going to be 5% of the time where you're weak and where you actually have desire. And, and you'll probably flip it open. And the thing is, is when we have unfiltered and unguarded and unaccountable internet access, it's the exact same thing. It's that accessible. It's that easy. And so I think I've shared it before. There are lots of different programs out there. I use one called Covenant Eyes, which sends every web page I look at to three of my best friends. You have no idea how much that, that curbs that, <laughs> that uh, temptation. There's obviously a lot more we could say about this topic. But the, the main idea I want us all to go away with is that our Father is asking us to back away from the edge. It'll put us out of step with, with everyone around us. It may, might make us look funny. It might mean we have to put in certain boundaries at work that, that no one else is doing, but that we have to somehow figure out how to do. But our Heavenly Father, because He loves us, says, I want you to back away from the edge morally. It will safeguard your relationships. It, it will be the wisest and best thing. He asks us to do that for our good. Let me pray for us, and then we'll respond to worship.